Welcome to One on One, where we get to speak to some of the top leaders in sports media and sports technology. We're so delighted to have Gillian Zucker join us today. Gillian is the president of business operations of the Los Angeles Clippers. She leads all of the Clippers business functions, as well as the iconic concert and live event venue, the Kia Forum, the G League Ontario Clippers, and the development of the Intuit Dome, the future home of the Clippers. Gillian has more than 25 years of experience in the sports industry and has worked in all major sports, from the NFL to baseball, hockey, and motorsports. Gillian, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here, Rick. So, why sports? Where did it all start? Where did this passion for sports come from? Uh, I think it started when I was about seven years old. My father took me to a New York Yankees game. It was my first live sporting event. I think he regrets it to this day because he's a Mets fan. And, uh, <laughs> and Reggie Jackson hit a home run. And I remember he told me to bring my glove and I was sitting out in left field. And I think we were, I don't know, in the second to last row or something. But I was absolutely convinced that he was going to hit a home run to me and sat there <laughs> the whole game. My dad said he'd never seen anything like it, a seven-year-old so intent on every single pitch. And he kept saying, are you ready to go? And I was like, no, the game's not over. <laughs> so he <laughs> says he should have known then that this is where I would end up. But uh, I think it's been a lifelong passion of the way sports make people feel, you know, this idea that that was a memory that I have with my father that I'll never forget. And, uh, you know, the countless others that I've had along the way with friends, family, uh, co-workers uh, and otherwise. So sports is pretty special. It brings people together in unique ways. So you also worked for one of the iconic minor league franchises as well. Tell us about the experience uh, there. Yeah, the Durham Bulls, you know, um, I spent eight years in minor league baseball. Durham, definitely a destination for anybody who works in the minor leagues. Um, an extraordinary uh, facility, extraordinary ownership, extraordinary integration with the community. Um, and, you know, certainly a, a foundation and, and bedrock of the Triangle region for Raleigh, Durham uh, and Chapel Hill. It was a wonderful place to live, incredible people um, and obviously a great sports town. So you've been with the Clippers since Steve, Mr. Ballmer, bought the team. How did you land this job? I've heard some interesting stories about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I was, I, I had a job I loved. I mean, I really, I loved uh, working in NASCAR. Uh, uh, the people who were there were incredible. I'd been with International Speedway Corporation uh, running facilities for uh, almost 15 years at that point. Um, and had been at Auto Club Speedway for about nine um, and while I loved what I was doing, I wasn't seeing the kind of challenge that I hope to uh, continue to see at that point in my career. And so um, I was driving home from work one day and I heard that Steve Ballmer was buying the LA Clippers. And I thought, wow, that's my job. You know, it's here in LA. It's working for somebody who's going to, you know, have big dreams and big vision, who's, you know, a legendary leader who's built some extraordinary things in his career and somebody I think that would challenge me and that I would learn from in an incredible way. And um, I just thought, that's it. That's that's where I'm going to go next. So I spent the next, I don't know, several weeks kind of coming up with a strategy on how I was going to get the opportunity to meet him because I was completely convinced. I have no idea why to this day, why I had so much confidence, but I was completely convinced that if he met me, he would hire me uh, and that I was, I was absolutely the right person for the role. Um, but for me, it was just this idea of taking a franchise that had been so tarnished and had been so under maximized and having the opportunity to shine light on it and allow the community in and really partner in a way that would make it one that would be really admired. And um, that for me was the kind of challenge I wanted to take on, especially in a market like this that, you know, shares the stage with so many other teams. So how long did that courtship take place? How long did you have to stalk him? Or <laughs> it was months. Get... <laughs> it was months. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because um, I literally enlisted everyone uh, in my network. And, um, you know, I, I, I tell young people this all the time, but, you know, establishing that network, especially in the sports and entertainment industry is so important because it's such a small industry. I mean, people bounce around all over the place. And so, you know, it was people inside my network, people outside my network, people I'd crossed paths with and literally anybody who I thought might have any kind of interaction with them, asking them just to, you know, say that he needs to meet me. Um, hoping that at some point, if he heard it enough, that he would actually agree to do it. And, uh, and that's eventually what happened. But, um, you know, after I, I landed the job, I decided that I was going to have a, a thank you for all of the people who helped me um, to secure it at my, 
at my home in my backyard and uh and I looked around and there were there were over 50 people there so wow. it was pretty it was pretty amazing you know nobody does these things alone and I think that um is something that you know I remind myself of all the time it's it's not just getting the job that you don't do on your own it's actually doing the job and the people that you have that surround you they really matter a lot that's a, that's an amazing story. Um, great lesson. When when uh, we were lucky to visit with you earlier this year, and you, you gave us a tour at your offices of what Intuit Don't will become uh, at the start of next season, um, and we were just blown away by the incredible guest experiences and the technology you're building there. Can you provide us on an up with an update on kind of how the building is coming along and are you on target? Well, we're on schedule, um, <laughs> which is really great. I think we've decided to add some additional features that we think are really going to transform the fan experience in a way that um, have cost a little bit more than we were originally uh, assuming that they would. But I think that they're going to be worth it and pay dividends in the long run. Um, I sort of feel like at the end of the day, we've left no stone unturned when it comes to the experience, not just for the basketball fans who are there, but also for the athletes that are there, for the performers that are going to come um, around the acoustical treatments that we've done in the facility, um, making sure that we've really thought through what the experience will be like for food service workers, what the experience will be like for our guest services workers, uh, what it will be like for the people who load in the concerts, what it will be like for the media. Um, and at the end of the day, what we hope is that we've asked enough questions and that we have learned enough from all of our counterparts throughout the league who've been so open to sharing with us that when people walk into this facility, they will feel like, oh my gosh, they listened and they built this with me in mind, whatever role you may play in why you're entering into the facility. So I think we're making progress. There's a bunch of things that we're doing related to technology that are still evolving. We have some amazing partners who I think are super committed to trying new things. Uh, we're taking some risks, but we think that uh, There'll be great reward with great risks, and uh, and if everything comes together, I think that uh, we'll delight and amaze a lot of people, and hopefully share some resources for the future with others, so that you know we can continue to make live events evolve. There, there were so many impressive aspects to the arena that we saw, and it all revolved around and differentiators. But the thing that I was it, it, there were many things, but the thing that I was most impressed with in terms of creating a home home court advantage was the wall. Tell us a little bit about the wall and how that design came to be. Um, so the wall is actually, it's, uh, it, it came about from multiple different directions. So, you know, not our idea. Um, Steve went to visit uh, San Diego State. And when he saw San Diego State, he said, oh my God, look at the power of these grandstands, how close they are to the court and the kind of energy that they provide for the athletes who are playing on it. And he's like, I want something like that. And at the same time, we had had a visit from Dortmund Football Club um, from Germany, and they had been sharing some details about their yellow wall, which is sort of this amazing uh, fan centric uh, sea of humanity that's been around forever and ever. Um, and so taking that tradition and really morphing that into something that's more appropriate for an American based basketball team. So we've stolen some ideas from uh, the Cameron crazies and we've stolen some ideas from Grand Canyon University. Um, and we have brought in a little bit from San Diego State in terms of architecture. And we uh, we've learned a little bit from our friends over uh, in Europe at some of this, the Premier League teams. We went and visited Tottenham and saw the kinds of things that they're doing. And then we've tried to put our own special twist on it. So um, I think that we're going to have something that's really fun. Uh, that is a place that people are going to be excited to spend time, maybe for one event, maybe for every event. Um, but it'll be uh, part of what makes the experience special. And certainly, I think if, if we get it right, we'll provide the most fierce home court advantage in the league. Yeah, I mean, listen, we've all heard uh, about the 1200 bathrooms that are going to be in the facility and the 199 countdown clocks, but it's all focused around the guest experience, right? And it's, and to your point, the players, the workers there, um, the sight lines, the suite amenities are all incredibly impressive. The 360 degree, 38,000 square foot scoreboard. Um, how do you, how did you prioritize these, these amenities and these, this technology to make sure that you got it all right? Cause it's, it's a really complicated process to, to put together a $2 billion building. And yet you, you are, you're moving towards a, a on time, you know, kind of launch. Yep. I mean, how did, how did you prioritize it all? Um, it comes down to people. 
So we actually have a very long list of priorities. I, I always like to say, oh, you could boil it down to you know half a dozen things or things on one hand that you would say these are our priorities. And I feel like with with Steve that that tends to grow and grow and grow. <laughs> um, and so we have a lot of them. And so the way that I think that we um, keep in check is that we have an A on an every priority. So there is somebody who is responsible for each one of these things. And uh, we try to go out and find people who bring a unique perspective, really collaborative people, people who communicate well, people who share, people who speak up when they have challenges, who solicit help. Um, and I think all of those things are what make this organization so special and so strong is that you know we have a lot of priorities, but we have one person on each one and they're the ones that are responsible for delivering it. So when you have that, you're able to deliver deliver a lot of things well. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll see all of that come together this summer. You kind of hit on my next question, which was, what are those skills and attributes that you look for in, in executives and coworkers? Are there others that you kind of lean into and say, these are the type of people, this is the type of DNA that will work within the Los Angeles Clippers organization? Well, I think um, it starts with curiosity. Um, people who are really interested in uh, sort of what's happening in the world, and then people who are um, able to use their intelligence to be able to apply that to something that we might be thinking about or might not be thinking about. Um, people who are willing to take risks and are willing to speak up and um, are willing to uh, assess when something might not be working out the way that it needs to and will pivot. Um, so people who will find a way to figure something out where others think it's impossible or others think that it can't be done, um, who are gonna say, no, that's not true, it just hasn't been done yet. Um, and how would we get there and who do we need to help us and what sort of resources are available to me? So I think all of those things are the types of attributes, um, high character people, high integrity people, um, but people who are really results focused and who um, have a lot of passion and enthusiasm and energy around work, who just, you know, don't say, oh gosh, I have to go to work, but say, I get to go to work and um, I get to pursue something that, that uh, contributes back to me in a way where I just accomplished something I didn't think could be done. Um, so those are people who, who achieve great things in this organization and we have a lot of them. That's, that's great. Um, we recently were lucky enough to work with you on the placement of Tommy O'Hare as GM of the Clipper Vision Service. Um, you were one of the first teams out there kind of leaning into direct-to-consumer. Uh, and at the time it launched, Mr. Balmer said something that he thought content was headed towards mass personalization, mass customization. You've created a service that offers a lot of different things to a lot of different constituencies. How are you still leaning into that? How do you think the other team owners across the league and across other sports are going to reinvent their direct-to-consumer uh, opportunities? Yeah, I mean, we're certainly seeing it already. Um, there are multiple other teams that now have direct-to-consumer products, and that is amazing. Um, these are exactly the types of initiatives that make us most proud is, hey, we try something, we figured out a way to make it work, and then we watch others as they take that concept and improve on it, and then it's up to us to continue to reinvent and strive to continue to keep pace or to look for something that's new. Um, Tommy's done an amazing job in the period of time that he's been here, bringing in new and different features. One of them that I love the most is this new Watch With Friends feature that uh, I'm excited about because uh, you know, we opened with this story about how I love watching sports with my dad. Well, he lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And now with Watch With Friends, he can have NBA League Pass, I can have Clipper Vision, and we can actually watch a game together. Um, so these are, you know, new and different things that I think are going to continue to be additive and provide value for people who um, purchase Clipper Vision. And uh, we've got a, a few other new things that are going to be coming online here in the next few weeks and months that are going to continue to make Clipper Vision interesting. Uh, we'll just continue to push forward, but we're also now learning from all of these other teams that have launched their own direct-to-consumer products and are doing things in unique ways that, that we haven't even conceived of. So um, everybody's learning from each other at this point. When, when you think about the, you know, kind of your career and breaking into sports, what advice would you give someone today who's looking to kind of make the move into sports? It's such a different world than when I was starting out. I mean, there weren't programs in college that were sports management programs. There wasn't a clear path to how to get here. In fact, I mean, when I, when I found that sports is actually an industry that 
is a career. Um, I, I had no idea that there were people who made a living working in, in sports. I thought the only way you could make a living in sports was to actually play the games. Um, so now I think uh, there's a lot more awareness around it. And that also means there's a lot more competition around it. Um, starting off early in the career, people have to be prepared to really, really work hard. These industries, they require long hours. They require a lot of sacrifice. You're giving up weekends, you're giving up nights. And I think that for people who are considering it, it, it almost has to be something that that brings you joy. When people say, oh, I need this work-life balance. I mean, a big part of why I feel I have it all the time is because so much of what I love in my life is the work that I do. And I think that that's a characteristic that's important for people who want to pursue something in the live events business, just because it does require so much time. Is there any chance of us converting you to a Mets fan? <laughs> None. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> <laughs> After all these years, no. <laughs> well, that's, what, that's what fandom's all about. Uh, listen, thank you so much for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. I know you have a game tonight, um, and I appreciate you taking the time with us to talk on one-on-one. -on -one. My pleasure. Thanks for asking.